Let's take a moment to compare the different deployment modes for 802.1x. Uh, in the top row, you'll find the different modes. We have monitor mode, low impact mode, and then closed mode. Closed mode is typically what our, our objective is. That's where our goal is. And you can see there, before you authenticate, there's no uh, access that's granted. You can't do anything but pass EAP traffic. After you authenticate, of course, well, then you can log into the network, you can do whatever it is that you may need, but nothing until you authenticate. Now, that's our goal, that's our finish line, but if we take a step back from that, you have low impact mode, which basically leaves us with open authentication. You don't have to necessarily authenticate. Just when you attach to the network, we'll have a pre-authentication ACL. And once you authenticate, then we'll bring up full access, giving you a broader range of uh, capabilities. We'll potentially push down a downloadable ACL. And if we were to step back to even a more basic mode, this is where we have monitoring mode. And ideally, we can have authentication support, but it's open. So if you don't authenticate, you get onto the network. If you do authenticate, you still get onto the network. We may push down some parameters or make some changes post-authentication, but basically everybody gets in. This, again, as the name suggests, just shows us what, ha what happens without actually disrupting anything. Low impact, again, it's just kind of a step towards that finish line where we do have the, the objective of authentication so that we can reach full access, but really if we don't get in, it's not a big deal. And then finally, once it's up and running, fully implemented, no one would have access until they actually authenticate. So again, just looking at these in a little bit more detail, .1x gives us the following features. We can deploy .1x without having any effect on our end user or endpoints yet. That is, we can turn it on without breaking anything, which if you've head out, headed out into the network in the past with the best of intentions on how to make your environment more secure, but unfortunately, uh, you turned on some security features and maybe broke something that you didn't know was gonna break, that stuff happens, which is nice because with monitor mode, we can kind of look at what's going to happen uh, before we really break anything. And then we can enable this on a port by port basis. So I know a lot of features we can implement at the VLAN level. This is actually going to happen at the port level. So we can create a small VLAN just for doing a test case in, make sure it works as we would hope. And then we can deploy this on a port by port and VLAN by VLAN basis, just meaning that it won't be as disruptive should something go wrong. Uh, having visibility into the .1x operations can show us what's actually happening. That is, we'll attach a, a laptop perhaps to a switch port. Um, we'll go ahead and browse the internet. Of course, that works. If I fire up uh, an 802.1x supplicant and I send an EAP login request, will the switch process it? It should, and then we should see that occur through the monitoring. Um, examples of connected endpoints would be anything. You know, PCs, printers, cameras, various IoT devices. Um, where are they connected? Could be on a switch, physically, could be wirelessly through radio, uh, just attached to an access point. Each of the devices that we attach, we wanna say, are they sending EAP credentials? Are they actually trying to participate or not? That just indicates that we have to go down to the client level and enable 802.1x and EAP. And ultimately, if that's configured and they have valid credentials, they should be able to log into the network. Uh, with low impact mode, we're taking that open authentication and just bringing it a little bit further. Uh, we're gonna have an ACL that allows for basic connectivity, maybe just web browsing, but nothing like file transfer, nothing like remote desktop, nothing like um, uh, perhaps VNC or other applications that you have in the environment, but we're just not letting access to those yet. So what can you do? Uh, DHCP, DNS, um, port 80, port 443, but maybe that's really it. And then after you authenticate, you're granted a broader level of access. And this happens by pushing down a downloadable ACL. That typically happens from the identity services engine and it gets pushed down uh, to your switch or you'll have a rule set that's pushed down to your access point. In ultimately closed mode, this is what's gonna give us a truly secure network. Should somebody come along in the middle of the night and just plug into an unused network jack, nothing happens. Okay, so they move over to another jack where there was a machine plugged in. They unplug that one, they plug themselves in, and we've got the door guy there, the authenticator that stops that traffic, and it says, wait a second, who goes there? And it gets that dialogue started where you can't do a DHCP request, you can't ping anything, you don't even have uh, an IP address, right? Because the first thing you have to do is authenticate. And remember, that leverages EAP, which works at layer two. 
So before you can do anything else, you have to auth. Once we auth, then we determine, out, uh, we determine whether or not you should be allowed into the network. And once we know whether or not you can come into the network, we can determine to what level of access you know, should you be granted when you're roaming around, what level of authorization. Um, really neat how this all ties together. So because we've got these different deployment modes, realize these modes can be used to kind of gradually increase your security posture, and we can do so at a port by port level. Um, I really like starting off small, just doing a test of VLAN, making sure everything works the way that I would hope, maybe trying a different, couple different operating systems, and then extending that out to maybe a small group of technical users or developers that are um, a little bit more excited about technology that want to tinker and kind of help give you some feedback on how it's working. And once you get the, uh, the wrinkles ironed out, just bring it up, it starts to become very, very easy to scale. So not everything's going to support 802.1x. Let's say that we enable it, we start to roll it across our environment. It worked fantastic in the lab. It worked great with my technical uh, coworkers. They were into it. Uh, but we started hitting some issues. Maybe we come across certain tablets that don't support 802.1x. IP cameras, IP printers. There's HP laser jets out there, <laughs> older than I am, uh, that are still printing, just chugging away. Nobody's going to get rid of those. They're just sitting around, chugging along. Uh, we've got IP phones that are older. You know, not everybody wants to replace handsets every five years. So maybe we've got uh, you know phones out there that don't support .1x. Uh, point of sale systems, wireless scanners for inventory. Think about all the IP enabled devices in a hospital, within agriculture, etc. Um, there's lots of gear out there that they just didn't bake 802.1x in. The, the vendors who build this stuff, they go, ah, well, enterprise isn't our primary customer, so we're not worried about it. Um, even when enterprise is, I mean, think about who runs UPS, typically um, enterprise workers, but that IP-enabled interface for out-of-band management, does it support .1x? There's a good chance it doesn't. Most of our laptops should. Windows, Linux, OS X, they all support .1x, but it doesn't mean that it's configured. So what can we do? Uh, obviously, we can do what's called .1x fallback, where we say if .1x isn't responding, not a situation where they, they tried to respond with the wrong credentials, they're just not giving us any EAP traffic, what can we do? And the answer to that is going to be MAC authentication bypass. Uh, this is commonly abbreviated as MAB. And ultimately, what we do within the user database, we create a user account where the MAC address is both the username and the password. I know this sounds pretty goofy, and it's, it is very simple. Um, and it, again, it just gives us basic authentication for endpoints that are incapable of 802.1x. This is for backwards compatibility. Never in security discussions do we bring up backwards compatibility and then say, aha, look at how much more secure everything is. It's, all, it's almost like, here's this really cool solution, and then backwards compatibility kind of shoots us in the foot a little bit. We just want to keep this in mind, right? Because there is no authentication, it's just a MAC address. If you've got an IP-based printer, and that, uh, let's say that that printer doesn't support .1x, right? Um, still prints just fine. We can set it up on the network, and we'll do it in such a way that the interface that it's attached to has an access control list. We're only going to allow print jobs to occur. That means if somebody attaches a nefarious device, they're trying to do maybe art poisoning, maybe they're trying to do different types of scans, we can look for all that, we can protect it at the switch port. We can still shut the switch port down if we see anything. But remember, if you were uh, offensively minded and you walked up and you said, I want to get into this network, you try one port, you see that e uh, requests are being sent to you. You can see that just sniffing. You don't have to send any packets. Um, and you can also request them and, and they'll come in, of course. Um, but we go, OK, they're using .1x in this environment. What else can we do? Look for a dumb device. Look for an IP camera. Look for a printer. Uh, any type of appliance that may be sitting around. There's IP-enabled crockpots these days. Um, find that device flip it around on the back of it, and it's going to have the MAC address. It's printed, it's a sticker, it's on the device typically. Or, especially for things like printers, we can just print a status page. A lot of times that will include the MAC address. It doesn't look too strange that you're uh, messing with it if you're the attacker. Printers get jammed. Of course, you're spinning it around and bringing trays in and out, and then, of course, you get the MAC address. You can change the MAC address on your laptop attached to the network, and you would be in just as though you are this device. So uh, I explain that not because this is an offensive course, 
but just so that you can be mindful when you're you know, creating your defenses for your perimeter. .1x is definitely what we want to do. That's the most secure way to authenticate. Um, and then within .1x, we've got stronger and weaker EAT methods, right? Tunneled versus non-tunneled and so forth. But when we look at MAC address bypass, this is just a reality of modern networks. It's something we do have to support, um, but we just want to be mindful of it. We can create very specific rules on those ports and treat them as though they're going to be less trusted. Good stuff to think about. Uh, here we see an example of how you fall back to MAC authentication bypass. Um, what happens here is you've got your EAP login requests. Notice that these are being sent by the authenticator towards the endpoint. Now, when you send this message out, you wait, and after a timer expires, you send it again, and after that timer expires, you send it again, and then eventually you say, well, I guess 802.1x isn't going to work. At that point, we listen for a packet to come in, we look at the MAC address, of course, is the source address in the Ethernet frame, and we punt that to our radius server. If the radius server has a definition, it goes, oh, I know that MAC address, sure. Here's our attribute value pair, which gives us the name of a downloadable ACL. Sometimes people call it a DACL. Um, that DACL would be downloaded. It gets pushed from your radius server down to the switch and then applied to this port. So after the authorization, which occurred, based on MAC addresses, we can allow a, a greater level of access into the network. See how that failback occurred, but we still were able to do dynamic authorization? Um, again, once that's done, we can perform our accounting, which is just the records of what's occurred. Uh, we also have the concept of a guest VLAN. Now, this is important to understand. Watch what's happening here. After three EPRI tries from the switch, and there's no response, we take unresponsive hosts and we give them guest access. Why? Because they don't understand EAP. Now in that guest VLAN, maybe we do something like central web authentication. We punt them to a portal and make them authenticate there, but we're still letting them into the network. We're still giving them DHCP. Uh, we'll do some change of authorization once we know who they are. But again, guest VLAN is when EAP uh, times out, not when it fails from bad credentials. A restricted VLAN is what you'll use when somebody authenticates with bad credentials. That's what you see here. Here's the EPO I'll start from the client. We say, okay, go ahead and let us know who you are. They tell us, we punt it to Radius. Radius says, nope. They try it again, it says, nope. We've got this failure. So we go, okay, since they've failed to authenticate, we're gonna assign this port dynamically to a restricted VLAN. And then once you're in that restricted VLAN, maybe they can do certain things. It's up to you, you're the administrator. When we look at .1x, realize that it can work in different host modes. This is important for the way that you set up virtualization on endpoints. If you've got developers or anybody that's working with uh, virtual machines, um, we'll want to watch this because a second client showing up on an authorized port makes it an unauthorized port, right? So uh, go ahead and fire up my laptop, log into the corporate domain, fire up VMware Workstation, bring up my Kali Linux VM to get access to some tool that I wanted to use, or Parrot Security, I've been using that one a bit more lately. Uh, so let's say that that's what it was. I fire up my Parrot VM. Now I go to connect to the network to use some handy dandy tool, and the network says no way. Why? Because it sees this other device trying to piggyback in. If I want to support that, they've got a multi-host mode. So the first device or MAC address is authenticated. Once that device authenticates, it basically opens up the lane for all the other devices to come through. Now, I know that sounds bad when we think about it happening through a switch, right? You'd have a user that attaches and authenticates. We let this port open, and then an unauthenticated user gets to ride in behind. This can absolutely happen. There's attacks. Um, some of them were, I remember at B-Sides Tampa last year, there's uh, the folks from Black Hills InfoSec were talking about defeating EAP and some of the mechanisms that they would use in attacks for EAP MD5. And some of them have to do with using a physical tap, getting in line, and letting the first device authenticate. While this is great for virtual machines, <laughs> it's bad for stopping actual hackers or bad guys. So what could we do there? We could define MAC addresses, we could whitelist MAC addresses, we could require 802.1x on every supplicant. That would really be ideal. Um, but you can't always do that depending on the way that your virtual machines and supplicants are hooked up. Uh, think about using you know, GNS3 or some type of virtual appliance. Uh, it just may not support .1x. 
So this can be handy, just be aware of the various modes. Um, Multi-domain authentication, kind of continuing with the various types of modes, it gives us one data device and one voice device per port, and we've got independent authentication of the phone and PC. And then finally, the multiple authentication mode authenticates every MAC address. This means when I fire up my Parrot security VM, it has to have a .1x supplicant. Uh, no big deal, assuming that it's been installed. But if it hasn't been, it can become a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing to get your system patched. Uh, so that you can actually log it in. In that case, what I'll typically do is I'll take my laptop, I take the virtual machine, and I tell the virtual machine to pat or NAT through the laptop SNC. So here's an IP address. Let's say that I'm running uh, Windows 10 on my laptop. I've got a Linux VM here that wants to get out. If I first authenticate to Windows and then I NAT, opposed to bridging the NIC, Inside of VMware networking, I'm just going to NAT or share that outside interface. This is going to get me by the .1x authentication, allowing me to patch. Flex off just means that you've got the ability to tweak the timeouts and fallback mechanisms. So what should we try first? Normally we try .1x first, but maybe your organization's a little bit weird, and you've got five devices that support .1x and 100 that do MAB. Well, let's do MAB by default, right? And then we can jump over to .1x when necessary. So flex auth just means that you can change the order of mechanisms that are used, and you can also tweak the timeouts. Timeouts are important. You know, a lot of times if we're doing .1x first and falling back to MAB, what will happen is you'll say, I'm going to wait for 30 seconds for .1x to timeout. 30 seconds is a long time. And you go, I'm going to wait for 30 seconds again. And I'm going to wait for 30 seconds again. In user land, this is forever. And they're typing in URLs, and they're refreshing the website, and they're looking at the IP address. And this happens every time they log into the network. So if we want this failure to occur a little bit faster so that things can fail over, um, we can go ahead and tweak that. And inaccessible authentication bypass, uh, this one's a bit out there, but it's a, a good one to know. Um, I know certainly everyone watching this video would never uh, deploy an authentication solution with a single point of failure, so you'd never experience this. But if one of your friends or family members calls you, imagine your aunt calling you, and saying, hey, what's going on with our ICE server? And we say, do you have an ICE server or an ICE cube? We're not talking about NWA or wrappers. We're talking about a collection of redundant ICE servers. If we've got redundant ICE servers, they'll go into a radius group. And the cool thing about the group is if one of the, uh, the servers is down, we just go to the next server. It's a list. And of course, we can tweak the timeout for how long we wait for something to respond. But let's say that both of our systems failed, or we were in that solution where we didn't have an ICE cube, we just had an ICE server. Um, in that situation, if your ICE server is down, this is a different type of failure. It's not that someone failed to authenticate or failed to respond to EEP. They're trying to do EEP. But when we talk to the, the authentication server, it's just not responding. Um, this is what we would call critical. So in that scenario, if ICE is down, we can fall back to a critical VLAN. So don't get this confused with your guest and restricted. Um, the critical is to support a down ICE server. Anyhow, I hope that makes sense of a couple of the different ICE implementations that we can do. Looking at our timers, again, we can control the timeouts, which is going to change the behavior between when we send these identity requests and then when we retransmit. And we've got to go through the maximum retransmissions before we go, OK, well, I guess they're not going to auth. Let's try something different. So again, by reducing these, we can kind of expedite this process. The downside is when expediting this, we go, oh, this works great for me. I've got this brand new 15-inch Razer laptop, SSD drive, you know, tons of memory. It just rips. It boots in seven seconds. What about the person who didn't get a new laptop? What about the person over here <laughs> on some crummy, you know, 10-year-old laptop waiting to get an update, uh, and it just takes forever to boot? And when it boots, it's got to load all this additional software, and it's on an old spinning hard drive it could actually time out. It's saying, I wanted to do EEP, but I didn't get there in time. Now they've triggered and they've tried to do MAP. Um, again, this is a scenario in environments where we've got slower supplicants, just something to be mindful of when we're tweaking these timers.